Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Observer Football Podcast. And we are here today with our most esteemed guest, Sedu Mo. Now, Sedu was uh, on earlier in the podcast talking about his journey from Ghana all the way to the United States. And if you haven't watched the episode, please make sure you click the link above because, wow, what a story. And just, I was left speechless after that story because, Sedu, you went through a lot and survived the unbelievable. Like, I couldn't imagine going through that. And, you know, just something that, like, really resonated with me, even though I've known you for quite a while, it's still, like, jaw drop because I'm like, I, I can't believe someone went through that. And I'm just so happy that you were able to get through that. And you're here with me today. You're thriving. And just seeing you succeed in being a mentor in the community. So, again, thank you so much for joining me here today. And I want to kind of continue your story. Going from the United States to the good old peg, the Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. So I guess, uh, yeah. So where we kind of left off was that you're talking about we were with the um, potentially being forced with being deported back to Ghana. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what I would say. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here again on the second podcast. And uh, yeah. Uh, so in the United States, when I go to the United States, you know, like uh, in the first book, I, I was saying, like, they put us in the cold room, which is a small room that you see, like, uh, the uh, people, like uh, the Mexicans, the Panamanians, all of them were there mm-hmm. in that room. And it wasn't a good feeling. Then the cold was too much. And we asked them to turn off the AC. They said, no, no blankets, no uh no if no mattress for us to sleep on so it was just cold the blanket the blanket that they gave us was was very light it it does nothing so yeah from there we we, we were there we didn't they didn't give, we didn't even take a shower for like seven days so this is like when you're still in the united states like in that's in the center? united states yeah in the detention center okay. we didn't we didn't uh the food we eat is the same food we eat for seven days. Wow. And you were saying that that food was like rotten? Like it Some was... of them were rotten. Like you can't even eat because the food that they give us in the morning is the same. We eat two, two times a day. So they will bring us another food in the around like 3 p.m. The same food we eat in the morning and we, they feed you like 5 a.m. Really? Yeah. And 3 p.m., you get a, you get another food, the same food. So the food that they will bring, give you in the morning, that same food in the in the evening is rotten. So what kind of food is it? Is it like... It's like a taco with the beans in it. Okay. It was wrapped with the bread. And there's beans in it and some... Uh, in, a, in a juice box. Okay. And... But the tacos, like, you know, beans, you cannot put it for a long time like that. So by the time they bring it to us, it's rotten. So we don't eat. We don't take shower. We don't brush our teeth. They didn't care to get, let us like, have a good hygiene. And from there, they just transfer us to a different detention. And that detention also was very bad. We went there. They made us stay there like we couldn't sleep. If you, were, if you try to Sleep, they will just wake you up because they don't want you to sleep at that time because they have to check and process you to a different detention too. So that's where me and my friends were separated. They separated us. Some of them, they put them, uh, they took, uh, as they took us to uh, California uh, Detention Center, the name of that place was Atlanta, Atlanta Detention Center. And it's a private detention. I think I heard now. They have closed the detention because of how they treated refugees there. So that's where they took her. They took some of my friends also to Las Vegas. They took some of them also to a different state. So they have separated us. And I think, sorry, just going back to the first podcast, you were also saying too that you were in there for a year, right? Yeah, almost a year. And then the reason, like you said, the privatized, right? Yeah. So then more incentivized to keep you there. Because then they make more money each day based on each day you're there. And then, so I know, remember you talked about you had uh, your your brother and sister-in-law mm-hmm. um, were also um, 
in living in the United States. Yeah. And then I know that one of the biggest things that you expressed frustration on previously was you had a court hearing and you had a translator that wasn't translating correctly. Exactly. And when you expressed that, there was no accommodation for that. And even when you tried speaking English, they said no. you couldn't do that. So then getting out of, um, you know, it's going through that frustration, them ruling saying, no, you cannot claim refugee status here. They were basically saying you have to go back home, right? To try to deport you. Yeah. So then you were saying that, um, if I can recall correctly, that you had a, I don't know the name of the agent, but they had people checking up on like a probation Yeah, it's a, it's a bond, uh, bond company. Yeah. So the bond company, you pay a percentage, then they will come there and release you. So that's what my brother did. Okay. And he got a bond company and he paid a percentage and the bond company came to that detention and I was just sleeping. I didn't even know. I was just sleeping and I just heard my name. Said Muhammad, you are out. So, meaning, uh, not knowing is the detention, comp- uh, is the bond company that came for me. So, yeah, they came for me. They booked a flight for me. No, it's not even a flight. They booked a, like a, a bus for me and I went to my brother. So, we didn't really touch upon this because we had recovered such a lot of the story before. When you heard your name, like, what's your feeling? I know you probably gone through a lot. Probably not. Is this real? Like, how, how are you feeling during all that? Man, at that time, I was, I was like, thank God. I was just praying. Because that place is hell. You know? You don't have money, it's like a hell. If you don't eat, it's like a hell. If you are sleeping, it's like a hell. Because they will come and wake you up in the middle of the night, that the time that you are sleeping and tell you they want to do counting. You start counting everybody. And you, you will not even get a proper sleep the whole day. When you are there, sitting even in the morning, you are, you are outside in your detention, they will just let you go back in, and they will start counting. So they do like three times. They do counting three times a day. You know, so it was a good feeling. I was happy that I'm... Finally, I'm going out after the uh, after my unfair trial hearing, and I was like, "Man, I'm out." So I was I was happy at that time, and I didn't know my even my brother paid that bond company the percentage to come. I didn't. It was a surprise for me. I didn't know any. Just and I went and I went to Florida and went and met them. So you've been in prison for a year. Like I know, like that's. Sounds like survival of the fittest, right? Like you yeah. gotta have food, just money, just overall just trying to survive. But then you're going back to everyday society. You know, I know you said you didn't have a job at the time, but you're living with your brother like and sister in law. How was that like how was that whole transition for you going back to you know, everyday life? The transition was a was a bit hard because after I got released, I went to my brother and my sister in law. I went there and it was frustrating for me because I was looking for a job. And I've applied for work permit. They, re- they denied like two times. And it was frustrating. I didn't, I didn't like sitting at home. I told my brother, man, I have to start doing something. I want to start working, you know. And they all, they all get it. Like they know the frustration. And my sister said, you don't worry. You're going to get a job. We'll try and figure out something, you know. She was very, very helpful. She was, she was, uh, she was the best sister that I can have in the United States, and she helped me a lot. She uh, and my brother too helped me a lot, and you know she's trying to find a way where we can even get a legal aid to help me so that uh, they can reopen my case for me to uh, for me to get a, a stay in the United States. But and the lawyers were charging a lot of money. You know, some of them were saying ten thousand. Some of them were saying fifteen thousand, and you know, it's a lot of money. My sister don't have, my sister and my brother don't have that kind of money because they have used all the money to pay my percent, to pay the percentage of my bond. You know, so it was hard for them, and I understand, and that's why I wanted also to start working so I can help them as well. But I couldn't. Well, there's only so much you can do, right? Like yeah. if if you can't have, if you can't get the work permit and, and you can't get hired, there's just not your hands are tied. Literally. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I know you said you had to meet, like, I also know you said, like, your uh, 
your family would also drive you two hours every two weeks uh, to your probation officer, like just for a meeting. Um, and I know you um, also expressed to you that maybe the officer wasn't the most kind toward you. Yes. Um, maybe based on the situation or just maybe who the person is, I'm not sure. Um, but then I know you also said that you um, took a move, right, from Florida? Like you went up, was it, Ohio, was it Ohio? Yeah, we moved to Ohio. Yeah, and you said that that uh, agent you were meeting with was a little bit nicer in your yes. situation. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of where we left off previously. And thank you for the context again to get more explanation on that because I feel like we didn't really have time to talk about that. Yeah. Um, so then I know that at the time they were trying to deport you. And I know that there was some uh, delay because the Canadian embassy wasn't Get releasing your passport maybe, yeah. because you lost it along your journey for through South America. So yeah. causing a delay. So, you know, the United States is south of the border and Winnipeg is above in Canada. So can you kind of take me through the journey of like what prompted the action to come here? So the action was started in 2016 when Trump was running for president in the United States. And I saw it in the news, 80 Ghanaian people were deported back home. So I was like, nah, I don't want that. I don't want to go back there. So my brother helped me and I told my brother, did he see the news that they were, uh, the United States have deported 80 people? And he said, yeah, he saw it. And I told him, man, I, I, I cannot go back home. And he understand and he know what reason why I cannot go back. And he just, you know, helped me. And, uh, and he just helped me, like, you know, started to do research on the internet. And at that time, my, my goal was to stay in the United States. I didn't know there was, like, my, I didn't even think of coming to Canada, no, at that time. But it was just a crucial moment. And at that time, I just need to leave because I was on deportation. And, you know, every time I went to this appointment with, to meet my ICE officer, He's asking me of my document. Where well, he said, did you get your document? Did you get your document? And I told him no all the time. Every time I go there, I tell him no. But due to that frustration, I told my brother, man, I have to go. I have to go to the, I have to go to Canada. Does he know anyway? He said like, yeah, we can take a bus. And we went to the station and booked a bus. And we did two, I think we did two days in the bus. Before we went to, we, went, we got to uh, Grandma which is on the, like, uh, it's, uh, it's in the United States. So, Grandmont and United States, uh, and United States border, it's a, it's a bit far. Are you saying it's Grand Forks? Yeah, Grand Forks. Okay. So, it's a bit far. So, that's where I met one of my friends that I came here with. I didn't know him back home. We never met. We never talked. He was my friend back home. But I, I, met, I met him there in the station, at the bus station at Grand Forks. And we started talking, you know, like we first we were speaking English because I went to him and I asked him, like, did he know the time? What the time the bus will come to the uh, to uh, to the Canada border? And he's like, he doesn't know. He's also waiting. And you know, he started asking me, "Oh, where am I from?" I said, "I'm from Ghana." And also said, "He's from Ghana." It was like then we switched to our local language, which is Hausa. That's where we started speaking in Hausa. And that's where we decided, okay, okay, I he's from Ghana, I'm from Ghana, we are speaking Hausa. And also you live in this in the play in the in the town that like I'm most familiar I'm 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 familiar with, you know. And I know I have a friends where he lives, but I never met him. So yeah. it's like comfortability, right? Like it's yeah. someone you can resonate with. Yes. So can I give me some pre-context? What did you think of Canada before? You, what, what was your pre-understanding of Canada? Because I know you before you talked about the American dream. Yeah. But before we talk about your journey here, what was your preconception of Canada? Honestly, I, don't, I didn't know much about Canada. No? No, I didn't know much about Canada. I didn't. My brother just told me, oh, you have to wear gloves. Make sure you, are, you dress warm. And he got me a gloves. And he, he got me a jacket. And he gave me one of his boots. But I didn't know it was that cold here in Canada because the cold in Florida is normal. But the cold in Winnipeg, man, is something else. It's absolutely something else. And that's what I was going to ask you. 
you're at the bus station. What time of year is it? Because North Dakota, Grand Forks especially, they're only two hours south of Winnipeg. So maybe not as cold, but they still get like minus 25, minus 20 yeah. temperatures. What was the temperature like when you got there? The temperature was cool, was normal. It's like, it's like when I was living in Ohio. I didn't feel that cold till I got to the Canada border because at that time, man, it was windy and it was very cold when we got there. And also, like, even the the taxi driver, me and my friend, because we got out from the, uh, we get off from that uh, bus station, and the taxi driver came to us and he asked us where are we going. We said, "Oh, can he take us to the Canada border?" And he's like, "Yeah, he can." So it took us because we we have no idea like how long it's gonna take for us to get there. So he dropped us somewhere around the middle of uh, of the street, and it, and he and he started showing us the direction. You go, you guys can move on your left because sometimes the U.S. patrol they patrol on that street, so be careful. And it was at night, you know. It's like he's smuggling us, you know. So it was at night. So at that night, we were like, man, he left us. They were just walking on the street by ourselves. It's foggy, and you cannot even see the road properly. We're just walking. And what's the temperature like? It's like, it's like I would say like 20 degrees, minus 20. Oh God. And then for those who don't know, it's wide open landscape. There's no like hills. There's no trees. Exactly. And we talk about the wind and, and the cold temperatures. It's called wind chill. And it makes man, it 10 colder. degrees colder than what yeah. it is. So he just he just dropped you off he in the middle. Dropped us off. When he dropped us off, he was showing us the direction where we we, we are going, like where we what what we supposed to do. He said like you guys go stay on your right, and every time you see a car, try and hide, because it said he told us the U.S. patrol always patrol there. At that time, so I'm just confused why he didn't take you just like to the border. <laughs> He was scared. He knows what he's doing. He knows. He knows. He knows the road. Mm. The, I what came to our thought even like he was asking us the our money, and we told him no. He have to take us there before we can give him the money, and he insisted that no, he cannot take us unless we give him money. And he said, and he asked us, and we asked him how much. He said two hundred, two hundred dollars each. And I'm like no, two hundred is too much. We don't have two hundred dollars. And he said, okay, how, and we asked him, how far is it going to be? He said, oh, it's not going to be, it's like two hours. It's like two hours. Okay, let's go. Then we gave him the money. My friend gave him $200. I gave him $200 because we just want to, we just want to leave the United States. We just want to leave. We don't want to stay there because of all the chaos that was happening there at that time in 2016 with the presidential election and, you know, people getting deported. So we didn't want to stay. We just want to get out from that place. And it was, we've, we we feel like it wasn't safe for us to be there. You know, so we just left and we gave this this guy the money and he took us, he left us in the middle of a, of a street. We started walking and we saw a tall, like, tall light, like it was blinking red and the taxi driver showed, that's, that's the border. He, he said, that's the border. So you guys just walk on your right and just go straight. We're just walking. Never ending walking. So, okay, so that makes more, like, I guess I can give more context to it. How, like, roughly how long was that walk for you and your Man, friend? It was a long walk. Like, it was a long walk. We were tired at that time. We didn't even have water in our bag. We were thirsty. It was very long. I don't know how long was it, but... The way we were feeling while walking, it looked very long for us. And we went to, if we were close to the border, I was, we, we saw like it's a landscape and there was a lot of snow. So that's where we started feeling the, the cold more. Mm -hmm. The wind, the, the wind started blowing on our faces. And we're in the middle of nowhere on the, on the landscape and the snow is above our waist here. We're just trying to, you know, sneak in. We don't want to go to the, uh, the U.S. Uh, I say the, the Canada uh, border service because we don't want them to send us back. So we're scared at that time. 
So we have to sneak in, pass through a different route and go in. So that's where we went into that place where there's no, it's like a farm, like the snow was on our waist. It's above our waist here. Yeah. And we have to just be walking in it. We have to even sometimes lift our legs for for us to get like, a, yeah, for us to even walk in that snow. So you're you're not walking on the road. You're walking in like the field. Field. And it was... So once we were working there, I was wearing a baseball hat in the wind. The you, weren't wearing the... A, you weren't wearing a, uh, a toque? You weren't wearing... I wasn't because at that time I thought it's a normal, like, you know. That's what I was saying. I was saying like, I didn't know much more about Canada, especially in Winnipeg. I didn't know. Yeah. You know, so... I was just wearing a baseball cap and I was wearing like three jackets and I was wearing gloves and even that gloves, the wind blew it away from my hand. And the reason why the wind even blew it away because when we were stepping in that snow, it's what about our waist, we have to put our hands in that snow and just lift our legs up. So that's where like one of my gloves also stuck in the snow and I was searching for it with my bare hands. I couldn't, I couldn't find it. And the other one too, gone. My baseball cap, the wind blew it away. So I was naked here. Did you have like a hood or anything? Nothing. Nothing. So that's where we started feeling the cold. The wind, the wind was too much. We couldn't, I couldn't see. I, I thought I, I was, I was going to be blind forever. I cannot see nothing. I cannot see anything. And I started feeling that my hands we started frozen. And there was ice in between my fingers. You know, that's where, like, so we're trying to, you know, when the, we, were that, we were working that snow too for a long time, and it was it was very long. And my friend, at that time, I, I cannot see anything, so my friend, he was wearing took. So he was the one who is, I just, you know, he just, I just hear, I just call him, so I use his voice and know where he is, you know, just to make it as a, Something that I can know where because at that time I cannot see anything at that time. My eyes was blind with the snow and I couldn't see. So I just hear his voice, then I will follow where the voice is coming from. So that's how I got to him because he was in front of me because I was at the back. I was just dealing with the cold. See, and that's, the, I mean, I, I have experience. I've been living here all my life. And I've had to walk like 30 minutes, like home from school. I didn't bring a hat or two. I didn't bring mitts. So sometimes it's a weird feeling in the cold because you get like that, sh- like I, for me at least, I get like a, a shocking stinging pain in the cold areas. But then after a while, it just becomes like you don't feel anything after a while. But like being that, it's like one of the most uncomfortable feelings. And just you talking about are you walking in like a, hip height of snow in the middle of the prairies with wind with no toque on like my ears like that that oh that that is just like it just doesn't doesn't feel good and just man like my ears was frozen i even have a little bit of frostbite on my ears you have to cut some of them like a little bit of it my face was frozen my eyes, I couldn't see properly because at that time I thought I'm going to be blind forever. My hands, my fingers were frozen. I cannot feel them. I cannot do anything. And in between them, it was ice. Like it's ice. It's stuck in. Like I can't even move it. My my boot, also the same thing. Like it was my barefooted. Man, it's frozen. Got a frostbite. And I was lucky that I didn't lose those toes in there. I was going to say, like even your ears too. And just like, you know, that like, I, I know losing your, like your, like the hand, like I know it's very traumatic and I'm, and again, I can never relate to that, but like that was, you could have, that could have been a lot more. Too it could have been a lot more. You could have lost like, you know, amputated your feet. Yeah. It could have been a whole other aspect to that. But so roughly how long were you walking for in the cold? I would say like seven hours. Seven hours? Yeah, including including in, in that snow. Because we were there, like, man, it was a very long walk, and it was a very long walk in that snow. 
Because like, there's no, we couldn't move faster. So you went through jungles <laughs> and without water for three days. And now you're telling me you went through minus 25 weather, seven hours walking through like the- Man, f- people were even saying, I didn't even know that how, I didn't know even the temperature. People were saying it's, it's about my, it, there was a warning on that day, cold warning, the wind. But we didn't know. No, well, it's it, like, here's the thing. Not a lot of people know about the climate, especially yeah. in Winnipeg. No, like if you ask, from my experience, a lot of Americans or anybody about where Winnipeg is, they have no idea. Yeah. Like literally one of my friends just went on a trip to, um, I think it was to New York, and they read the driver's license, and they said, what's Manaloba? <laughs> Manaloba. <laughs> they didn't know what Manitoba was, and they thought Manaloba. But yeah, so I can understand where you're, coming from like you you know you just don't expect that drastic change in climate and then especially going in that time it's hard to think about that right man we we even thought so after we got off from that place we got into canada we the, the first sign we saw was emerson yeah so that's the sign we saw and it was written in french and english so that's the sign that's that's how we know that we're in canada you know and we were standing in front. We were standing on the highway. Highway 75, MSN. We were standing there. And no car was... was. If you saw one car pass by, it's going to take at least 15 minutes before you see another car passing by. There's, there's no a lot of cars. So we were just standing in the middle of the street looking for someone to help us. And we were standing there waving. Nobody wanted to help us. And my friend... He have a he have his pants. The pants went down. He couldn't even lift it and put it up because his hands also was frozen. And I remember he was asking me, "Can I pick his pants for him?" And I told him, "I can't. My hands also is frozen." Because we were trying to help each other, but we couldn't. And he have to leave the pants there. He couldn't wear it anymore. He have to leave the pants because we cannot do anything. We cannot wear the pants. He cannot wear the pants on. And there was some, even some money and one of his uh, uh, Quran, like uh, our Islamic book, was in that pants, but he left it there. Mm. And he said his father gifted to him, but he couldn't do anything. At that time, we were just struggling with the cold. Like, the cold is like something like it's burning in our body. Like, we were just, we were not feeling that cold anymore. We were just feeling like we we're feeling burnt. Yeah. Because the cold turned into like like a fire in our body. And at that time, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't get help. So my friend and I, we started talking like, man, we started talking like everything that happened, it's already there. God, has, God knows what is going to happen to us. So we were just holding our hands and we're just praying. Whatever happens... That's it. God already planned it. We cannot do anything because we have that belief that whatever happens, it, it was already written. You know. So we have we have that. We were just praying because we know we are, we we thought we were gonna die there because there's nobody to help us because also like we're just feeling the cold. Nobody was wanted to help us. So we're just there and just praying, trying to give up. We don't want to go anywhere anymore. We just want to live or die here. That's, that's our mind. And we're just praying. Once we're praying, and we saw a truck driver coming. And we wave at him. And he stopped like five meters away from us. He stopped. He get off from his, from his truck. And he came out. And, he, and, he, and we ran to him. And he opened his door. And we entered that car. And he was asking us, what are we doing here? And we said, oh, we are from the United States, and we we are we 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 are going to Canada. And he said, "Yeah, you guys are in Canada now." And he was asking us like, "You guys were staying here for a long time." We said, "Yeah, we were staying there for a long time." He's like, "Man," and I remember he's trying to give me water at that time. I couldn't, I couldn't even drink water because at that time I was struggling. I was feeling the bend. From the cold in my body and I couldn't do anything and and right away he called 911 
And within 15 minutes, 911 came. And when the 911 came, and yeah, they took us into the ambulance because I was the I I am more in a critical condition than my friend. Because me, I, like I don't have anything on my head. I don't have anything on my hand. Like the the shoe that I'm wearing, the cold, like my skin and the in inside stuck in that shoe, and they couldn't even put it out. So they have to put like a, they put me on the on that bed in the ambulance there and they started putting like a warm blanket and they put something on my hand which is very warm and you know still I couldn't feel in it like I'm still feeling it I'm still feeling like something has been on my but I was just in that in that ambulance like crying like you know didn't know what to do at that time and they started you know trying to get our information our names and I couldn't even pronounce my name properly because I was in a difficult situation I was Suffering and my brother, my friend gave them my my name and everything, and they write it down. So right on, and we go and they took us to Morris Hospital emergency room. So Morris Hospital is where they started. They took us to the emergency room. They took all, all of our stuff. They put us. Uh, they took off my shoe and they took off all my clothes on, and they started, you know, treating us. This ad break is brought to you by Ike Sportswear. Are you looking for soccer jerseys for a cheap price? Well, Ike Sportswear has got you covered. Recently, I didn't have a Canada jersey and my guy, Ike Sportswear, hooked me up with this beautiful Canada soccer jersey. And this could have been a better time for the Olympics. Ike Sportswear has got you covered. Make sure you check them out in the description at their Instagram handle. You can either message them directly on Instagram or you can message them at the below phone number. And by the time I, I was asleep, I fall asleep. I didn't know what happened. In 30 minutes time, because of the uh, pains that I'm going through, and I just wake up. And I was, I scream. When I wake up, I screamed because I was feeling the pain. Especially my hand, I was feeling the pain. I was screaming. And one of the nurses came and she gave me a medicine and within like five minutes, I went back to bed. And I wake up again with a scream. So I was just, you know, I was just suffering at that time. I was feeling the pains in my body. And uh, so the following day, and they took us uh, in our room, me and my friend, they, they, have our, they put us in the same room. And yeah, we were there, and uh, the doctor came, and they started checking our hands because at that time, our hands were swelling with uh, fluid in it. So they have to take the fluid out. Mm -hmm. So they took all the fluid out and it started getting sore, like, you know, and they wrap it with a bandage and all that. And the doctor came the next day and we started hearing, like, uh, we had a frostbite. The other time, I didn't know what frostbite is. I don't know what frostbite is. I don't know what causes frostbite. I didn't know anything about that. And I asked the doctor, what is frostbite? And he doesn't want to tell me. He doesn't want to tell me that, like, maybe I'm, we're, going to lose our, we're going to lose our fingers. He doesn't want to tell me. So, me, when I, when I look at my fingers, like, I see the tissue, all the tissue there were dead. It wasn't moving. It was getting dry. And they were, I'm trying to move my fingers. They were in dry. And I asked the doctor, like, what is wrong? I can't move my fingers. And it was like, yeah. They tried to see what they can do so that to, my fingers will start moving again. So that's why he told us, like, he was telling one of his nurses that we got a first bite. So they have to transfer us to HSC. Mm -hmm. So that's where we went to HSC and HSC also, like, you know, that's where we started getting treatment and all that. And, man, I was going through pains at that time. And, like, in, yeah, like, in, uh, five days they, they took us and gave us a bed there and they were treating us and trying to see if they can do something on our fingers because at that time they know they know what they know what is going on but we, we didn't know so some of the doctors came into our room and they started checking like what they can do to help us maybe at least uh, at least have some fingers left on our on our arms and they check 
artery of this, the third artery of this will be cut off. Because those ones, the tissues are dead, they're not gonna come back. Though they told us we're gonna come, come we're gonna cut it off. So left with two. So that two, which is my thumb and the other one. So that two, at that time leading got frostbite. And they are trying to save those ones. And those ones also got frostbite. So they have to cut it off. The same thing. So they so they came in and uh, they told us we're gonna you guys are gonna lose your 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 fingers. And that time I was like I started crying. I was like, then how am I gonna work? Am I gonna do stuff? Am I gonna wear shit? Am I not gonna wear my stuff? What can I do? How I, and they were saying, no, you, you're going to be fine. You can do all that. you get someone to help you do all that. And I was, you know, at that time, like, the emotions were too high for me. I was crying. I was like, I couldn't take it. And, and, uh, and they, you know, and they did their best to make sure we have some fingers. But they couldn't. So they came and started checking. So they, so up here on my, I'm here. It's it's a skin from my thighs. Okay. They took and covered it there, so that that's those skins were from my thighs. You know, so because if they couldn't do that, they didn't do that. Like we would have, we would have been dead. All these hands, they would have taken it off, because the it's it's rot. It's like a, it's getting infection inside those, so they have to do it. You know, so. They took us to the surgery room and they, they cut all our fingers. And after that, they brought us back. By the time I wake up, I saw I have no fingers. And I started crying. I cried, I cried, I cried for like two hours. I was like, I didn't know. Like, it's like, a, it's like I'm having a dream, you know, and... They came and I started crying because at that time I was feeling a lot of pains. And they gave me like a pain medicines, like that will ease the pain. So they gave me that pain medicine and I fall asleep. And I wake up again. And I fall asleep, I wake up. So I've been waking up and falling asleep. At this, I've been waking up and falling asleep. So at that time, like, man, it's just pains. I was just going through pains. No any rest. I didn't get any rest. Like I was just feeling pains. Well, all that, well, first of all, like, your body, like, this to get some context, and again, like, just going through it, like, when your body gets super cold, you start to lose mobility, because the blood doesn't go there as much anymore, <laughs> and it starts getting worse and worse. So, in your situation, obviously, being on the cold for such a long period of time, and being basically, like, frozen, your body... And when it starts to reheat itself, like when it starts when you start getting reheated and start getting warm, it's a shock to the body. And yeah. all those nerves Instead that were frozen, and you, your body has got like a big, yeah, big uh, alert. It basically, like basically, pain supposed to alert your body, alert you that something's wrong or something hurts. So I can only like again, I can't imagine the pain that went through and just kind of, you know. Because again, it felt like a dream going in and out of, you know, with medicine and just getting all that traumatic news. It must have been a lot to process uh, in, a, in a short period of time. And again, I, I know that, again, I can only sympathize with you and to say like, you know, I know that was very hard. And, you know, I'm, again, happy that you were able to come through it, though, and to be able to... Um, you know, to thrive where you are now. I just want to say that as well, because like, I know you went through a lot of hardships. Um, we're still going to continue the story, but I just want to say like, uh, as a person, I'm like, I'm proud of you. Um, and just how far you've come. And, um, you know, just wanted to say like, you know, just I'm proud of you in general, just as a human being, just as a friend. And just like, you know, I'm happy that you're here. You're able to share your story and you're able to thrive. And just like, you know, like you said before, you know, everything happens for a reason. And I think we all have a purpose. I agree with that statement. I think we all have a purpose. And, uh, you know, I know that as much as it's hard, hard to talk about the pains and what, what happened, traumatic events, I just want to say, like, at least for my end and the community, we're, we're, we're proud of you. Thank you. So Yeah. Yeah, so through that, we are, uh, the, after the, the decision, every, uh, everything, like, they took us back to our rooms and we were just sitting there and, uh, 
like we're just going through pains every day, every night. We're just going through pains. It's pain by pain by pain. And the pain relief people came and they started talking to us. Like they have some pain medicines that they can give us. But those pain medicines are very strong. And that pain medicine will let us see some weird stuff. Because of me, the pain that I'm going through, I told them I don't care. I, I just want the pain, the pain medicine. And they put it in my drip, and I started feeling something else. So when I broke my, again, just, was it ketamine? I think so. Because when, I, I, when I broke my name. leg, I, I had, I, they put an IV drip through me through ketamine, and I was like the, I was seeing stuff <laughs> when, I Man, was, oh, when I was, I up. was seeing like weird stuff, like something like, elephant like i was like man what is this it's like in real life i don't know like the because like the pain that i was going through i told them i didn't care i need that pain medicine yeah because i'm going i'm going through a lot of pains so when they put that uh that pain medicine in my drip and i started feeling i started feeling dizzy i started seeing stuff and i started crying at the same time and i was like what is this so I started to, like, I don't know what happened at that time. I started to feel unconscious, like, I was just shaking on the bed. And my one of my friends was there, was greeting me. I didn't see that. He, he told me he was there, but I didn't see him. And he was the one who ran and called the nurses that something is wrong. I couldn't breathe properly, and they came in. And they came in, and they checking on me. Like, because they thought I'm, I'm about to die, because I was... I wasn't breathing. I was just breathing so fast and very fast and hard. Mm -hmm. And my friend, I couldn't even see. Like at that time, I turned blank. I didn't see anything. I didn't see what is, what was going on. And man, they came in, and uh, I was told it's the med it's the pain medicine that they gave me. So they took that pain medicine off. It's crazy side effects, isn't it? Man, it's 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 a very crazy uh, pain medicine now. And I and I got relieved. And my friend was told was telling me, oh, he was here. And I said, really, you were here when the thing happened. And he, but at that time, I didn't want, I didn't know because I was. He was saying my eyes was open, but I cannot see anything. It's just a dream, right? It felt yeah. like a dream. It felt like a dream. I couldn't see anything. And he went, and they rushed in and just take my oxygen. My oxygen was all right. And this, and they and one of the doctors thought like, no, it maybe it's the pain medicine. So they took it off. And I started getting better. So I started getting better day by day. But and also my 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 tie here because of they took the skin from there. It was getting numb. I couldn't walk. I tried to make sure like and I do stuff, you know, do some exercise and all that. And so I started walking a little bit with a with a crouch, like uh started walking with it and I started, you know, doing some exercise by myself walk on the hallway on the in the hospital and you know keep myself and I give myself some time and you know eating and making sure I get better every day. So that's where I started recovering. We would like to thank Subtle Savagery for sponsoring the Observer of Football podcast. Subtle Savagery is a local clothing brand here in Winnipeg, Manitoba that specializes in top quality clothing ranging from hoodies, t-shirts, sweatpants, hats, and many more different items. With limited edition drops coming on a regular basis, you can get yourself top quality designs that keep getting better and better. Now, if you visit subtlesavagery.com and sign up for the Insiders Club, you can be the first to buy the limited edition drops when they come out. And not only that, you can also get a 15% discount on those orders. I am blessed beyond belief to have Subtle Savagery as a podcast sponsor. Okay, Sadu. So going from that, so again, kind of just dropping it from, you know, just talking about that that whole journey through the, basically the frozen tundra, going through Grand Forks to Canada, talking about, you know, going in and out of consciousness, going through, you know, the amputation of your fingers, unfortunately. And then you're also talking about, you know, ketamine, the drugs, like they're not being able to make you see straight or just not being able to remember anything. So I know that, like, I heard your story when it first kind of came out, like, how was the press with you when you were in the hospital there? Man, the press was was crazy. It was too much. After even there was a time I told the 
nurses and the doctors, I don't want to talk to any press anymore because at that time I was going through a lot, the pains, and the press is also coming. And so I told them at that time I need some rest. I don't want to talk to any media. I don't want to talk to anybody. For now, I just need to rest. And uh, so we requested uh, in the media, one of the, I think it's CBC or Global News, we, rec- we requested to see the, the man who helped us. His name is Fla- uh, Franco. And we requested to see him and thank him for saving our life because we'd, if it weren't for him, we would have died in that cold. So, yeah, he came. And we were happy to see him. And when we, when we met him, we started crying. He started crying and his wife came. And they were crying. They brought us some clothing and some snacks. And, and we, were, we were so happy to see them because he saved our life that day. And, uh, and yeah, we requ- and he came and, you know, we talked. And he was telling us, like, he didn't also know, like, he, he was also, he told us, like, something was telling him he's going to help some people on his way. That's what he told us. I was like, see, maybe God sent you to come and help us, you know, because he didn't. He, we never know him. He never met us, but he was in his trunk and he was saying like something told him, he's he's going to help some people on his way, you know. So he was surprised about about that, and we were also surprised about that because, man, you know, we didn't know like he helped us, he saved our lives. And we are here today because of him. It sounds like again, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. yeah. And it's just that isn't that crazy to think about like that that pre sense, like, hey, like something major is gonna happen. And you know, for him, he's like, I'm gonna help somebody on my way back. And yeah. lo and behold, you're you two you yeah, both all, both yeah. you all of you cross paths and then look where it ended up, right? Yeah. That's quite that's yeah, quite so, the it's the sort that's that's quite actually phenomenal. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, yeah, we talked to him and all that. And, you know, we got our lawyer who is going to represent us in our case to have to seek an asylum here and get our documents here. So he helped us. We got that. And uh, so, like, for our day-to-day life, we have to go and sleep. Uh, we have to move into... So after everything, like, we started getting better and everything working was good. The doctor came and checked. We are good to go. So they gave us a. We they took us to a play, uh, somewhere around the HS HS HSC uh, to uh, to sit uh, to be staying there for now, so that they can get the nurses to come there, so that they can be changing our bandage and you know treating our our hands and our frostbites and everything. So we stayed we st- we stayed there for at least for a month, and after that they took us to a refugee. Uh, housing and uh, a lady called Karen she was a very good she helped she's been helping refugees for a long long time she we, yeah she moved us there and we were staying there and the nurses were coming and at that time also like you know I'm trying to be independent I don't want to be bothering people to be coming to our place you know helping us all the time you know help us take shower I was like man I don't want anybody to help me take shower. I can. I will try and see if I can do something. So we started to we started to figure things out on our own so that we can be independent. But for the drug and the treatment of our wounds, we told them, yeah, they can still come. But when it comes to you know washing ourselves, we want to do that. Our we want to try and figure out how we can be independent on that. So we we started doing that, being independent, going to the bathroom taking shower, brushing our teeth. And because of that, they have modified the, our bath, our uh, toilets for us because after we go to the toilet, we clean, we have to wash our bum too as well. So it was customized for us. So we were, yeah, we were fine. We were doing, we were doing well. We were independent. And uh, so we were taking our own, you know, medicines and we have, we have going we are we're going around and trying to do stuff and we got a therapy from the HS, HSC and you 
you know, trying to, they are trying to figure something out, how we can be, be independent, maybe come to the shoes, wearing our shoes, tying our lace, wearing our pants, shirt, you know, daily, daily, uh, you know, day-to-day stuff. So, so I'm always interested to hear that too. So like, how did you, like, so when they were teaching things, like, how do you, like, again, the little things we don't necessarily think about, like even buttoning up your shirt, brushing your teeth, eating, for example, like, how was that adjustment? Like, how did you learn to adapt? So I learned to adapt by using two of my arms, from, especially my brush. I hold it this way, then I start brush. You know. So when I go to, when we got an appointment from our therapy, like for them to find ways on how we can be, also like eating too is a problem because we have to get someone to come there and feed us at that time. So... We started going to the therapy, starting to find a solution. Now we can start doing all this on our own, not to get help from anybody. So, which they don't care to do it, but we just don't want to bother. Like, you know, we just want to be independent because they are not going to be there every day for us. We have to figure out what we can do for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, we we are find a way on doing those stuff. For the laces, I find a way on how to do my lace. I have to... I bought I bought this lace that is like a elastic lace and I use it once I tie it I don't have to untie it I just have to leave it there if I want to use my shoe I just want to put it on with a shoe horn so I use shoe horn and I use that elastic lace and also for eating we try to figure out something for eating we couldn't come out with anything good so for me I was I I was creative enough to draw them something that can help me even to have a writing device and an eating device. So I I wrote that on and I no, I drew it and I took it to them and they find it. So the spoon will go into that device, then I can use it to eat. And for the pen it's the same thing, and I can use it to write. So I figured out something that, you know creative and i just give it to them and i went there and did and they customized it for me so that's how like you know we started doing things and for my pants i have to only do velcro i can you know do zipper i cannot do buttons so i only do velcro okay you no know, so i have to take my pants to a tailor so that they can take the zipper off and put velcro it costs a lot and you know some of them, uh, some of these pants. I have this pant that I wear for a long time. I have to use it for a long time because it's expensive to do the velcro. So I figure, you know, just you know, figure it some stuff and get help. I got help from my Ghanaian community, especially Auntie Maggie and also Laura. You know, they help me a lot on this stuff. You know, so shout out to them. Because they have been helping me till now. Oh, wow. If I need anything, like if I'm, you know, they have been helping me. They never get tired of us. You know? So, yeah, so they help us with all that. And uh, and we, we figure out things on our own. So that's why, like, you see us right now, we are being independent. We don't want to bother anybody in nurses to come and give us drugs. So we find a way to do a lot of stuff. Now I find a way to do almost all the things that I was doing. Before, when I had fingers, you know, but there are some limits that I can do, but most, I would say 95% of things I can do it. I was going to say, like, when I've been, like, honestly, like, on ice, it, it, so when I've been around you now, for I've been, I've been working with you and just been, like, at a soccer events and just things like that for, like, almost a year now, I, I haven't, it hasn't, it doesn't come to my forefront. Like, I don't think about it because, like, you do such a good job at just, like you still notice it. Like it just seems so seamless. Like for me, it's like the only time I really noticed it, it was actually last week when we're eating uh, at the camp for okay, yeah. and you had the, and you had the device. device. That was the first time ever since like, it's just been like normal. Like I just, yeah. I just never noticed it before. And that's just a compliment to you. Like how good you gotten at it. Because again, for me, I have never noticed it. And I'm like, cause it just never was my forethought. And yeah. it was just, yeah. Like those little things I never thought of. I'm like, yeah. you know, you have to adjust these little things and things that you like. Yeah, it's just a compliment to you for how good you gotten at it and just how creative you gotten. Because not only do you have the support system, 
but you have to do it every day. Yeah. So comp- kudos to you. Cause like, again, um, again, just, wow. I just never noticed it <laughs> yeah. until early it's, last week. Yeah. Because we're trying to be independent. We're trying to, you know, do a lot of stuff without, uh, you know, bothering people because yeah, if we call people right now, we need help. They will come and help us, but we don't want to do that. We want to be independent and go out there and do what normal people always do. You know? So that's 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 what we have put on our mind that we're gonna do. Like you know, so almost ninety five percent of things, I can do it on my own. I'm being independent. I, have, you know, I do a lot of stuff. I go out. I do my dressing. I do wear my shoe. Have my shoe on. It's not a problem for me right now. You know, because I do almost everything. I can type, I can do a lot of stuff, you know. So these are the things that I've I have learned along the way because I try to figure out what I can do and what can I, I cannot do. I was and, gonna say fast texture as well. Yeah. <laughs> Just gotta say, like you text so fast. And I'm like, wait, you text faster than I do. So <laughs> like, oh wow, you know, cool. yeah. like that's like, it's really amazing. And yeah. I just you know, overcoming that challenge and being able to, again, 95% to get to, you know, do things normally and independently. So I guess there's a couple areas I wanted to talk about because, again, this channel, this podcast is celebrating, like, the soccer community. And, you know, we're going to talk about first, I guess, before we get into that, how was, like, the adjustment, like, I guess in terms of, like, I guess in terms of work, like, how was, like, how did the government help support you in terms of that process, like, with housing and things like that? I know you touched on it briefly. Yeah, so... For the for the support that I get from the system is like they help me with my rent, mm-hmm. food, my day to like bus ticket and all that. So they help me with that. And uh work has been difficult. You know. I sometimes get contract out and there to do go and do a job in the summer, but getting a full time job is the struggling. It's 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 uh it's something that I'm struggling with. No, because uh, I've applied for a lot of jobs. Some of them call me for an interview. I'll call you back. Never. You no. Know, so I don't know if it's because of my disability and they think I cannot do the kind of work they have. And, you know, I'm, I try to prove people that I can do, you know, I can do the job that they have because I know the job that I, I'm applying that I can do. And there are some jobs that I know I cannot do I, I don't apply you know but i have to apply for a bunch of work well, let me and, help let me help you with that because yeah. i've done recruiting for four years so I'll let, let me help you with that and i'll try and see if i can land you something yeah i'll Perfect. be happy yeah i'll be glad and you know those are the things that i'm struggling with right now I'm trying to get a full-time job mm. there's a contract job out there that i can get and most of them also are just sports related Something to go out, like you wake up in the morning, 8 a.m., you're at work, is, is the challenging thing. And that's the thing that I'm looking for. No. So, and I think, like, uh, the the setback is because people are thinking of, I cannot do it. You know, so, I try to, you know, I try my best as much to make sure, to let the companies know I can do a lot, you know. You know, even though, like, you know, in Ghana, I own my own T-shirt business, but, you know, it's not a, uh, it's something that I go out there every day in Ghana, and, but here, the, the system are different, and I know I have to learn, I have to get some experience, you know, but, you know, I don't get those kind of jobs, you know, so it's hard. Well, let me help you with that. I'll uh, after this, we'll, we'll we'll talk about resumes and we'll think about jobs, and I'll, and I'll help you treat it, see if I can get, get you something. Yeah, thank you. So then, okay, talking other than jobs. So you know, you've been in Canada. Jeez, taking too long. Eight years. Almost. Eight, almost eight years. years. Wow. So it's quite it's quite the time since then. It's, it seems like yesterday almost, yeah. but time has flown. Um, from my recollection, you also did play soccer when you, uh, mm-hmm. so you got involved with the MMSL and some of our premier teams, right? Yeah. So, uh, how did, um, how did you come about getting into the Manitoba soccer community here? How did you kind of go about that? Yeah. So 
I, uh, it was from Raf. So I was playing for the no, it was it was from Raf. It was from uh, Mario, one of my friends is a Portuguese, and uh, they have a team. It's like a community team. They play Division One, and uh, so they have this team. That this team is uh, representing like a guy who died. He he like uh, he formed that team. He was founded it, that. Was it wasps? Wasps. Yeah, I remember wasps. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. wasps. So, so I that's the first team that I play with uh, when I first came here. So Mario gave me that opportunity, and I play in that team. And you know, I was you know we were doing good at that time. Like I was playing defense, and you know we won most of our games, and we were in the second division, and we went to the first division. So like. Everybody, the supporters of Rwandan community were coming to watch us. They, it's a, it's like it's a Rwandan uh, team, and the Rwandans they come with their drum. Man, it was it came in the, the news even came that day, like you know, playing the drum and they were calling my name, you know, the supporters, you know. So yeah, uh, so that's where that's where I started getting involved in the MMSL league. See, and that's something that's because I I play for. Do you remember Forza? Forza. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I played Forza. for Forza at the time, and I remember I don't know if it was playing. I think it was on the opposite field at like Raf Cantafio. Yeah, and I just heard the drums just going, and it was just like it was. Yeah, it was like the game last weekend. It yeah. was just like it was just a big celebration party, and it was just like that. This the crowd noise. I'd never heard anything like that. But again, it was before Was. So yeah. I was like one of my clear memories. Is for, it's, a, it's a fortunate. I don't think the team's around anymore. Yeah, no, so. it's not around anymore. Uh, yeah. Such a special team. Yeah, it's uh, a special team. That team, like man. Uh, it's a special team, and uh, and they were very good people too as well. They were very nice, and uh, you know, it's like a family team. When you are playing there, it's like a family, and you get to enjoy it. You get to, you know, have like you know, talk to people, make friends, and yeah, it was a family team. Was was a very good team that I would play with, and the second one was uh, when I got uh, when I get to know Raf. At that time, I was staying at Auntie Maggie's. I think I came for a visit. I can't remember where I was staying there. So that's where I met Raf. And Raf Oween, right? Raf Oween. And for those who don't know, uh, Raf Oween's our Valor FC captain. Valor FC captain, yeah. So that's where I met Raf. So Raf, I didn't know Raf was in Canada here. I thought he was in Hero playing soccer. Because, man, Raf, back in going Ghana, he and a boy called Baba Rahman, they were, man, those guys, those two boys, they were very good. And Ralph went to Thailand for trial. He went to Switzerland. He went for uh, I think Brussels and went and do trials with Brussels. So me, I thought Ralph is in, is in, uh, is in Belgium. He's in Europe playing soccer. So when I came, when I came and met him and I said, Ralph, I, I, I didn't even, met, I said, I, it seems like I know you somewhere. And I said, did you ever came to our practice when we were practicing at Ghana, in Ghana, like at the field? He said, yes. And I said, man, how did you end up here? I thought you were in Hero playing soccer. So that's where we started getting the... What a like, small world, isn't it? Man, oh. I was like, Ralph. I, and he recognized me too because I was there. He came there and played with us. He played in our team there. And, and that's where I was, man. And said, what are you doing there? And he was telling me, oh, you know, say you do, we have you know this agent. I was like, man, Raf, you're supposed to be playing in Europe because man, you are too good to play. Yeah, man. And he was telling me, oh, he was uh he's playing a PDL at WSA. And I was like, okay. And you know, that's where he started co- connecting me with uh, the team and the team, they have men's team who are playing the MMSL league. And I went and played for MMSL League. And I played for the men's team. And at that time, you know, you know, I was still practicing with, you know, Eduardo. And, you know, the teams, the, the players wanted me to be part of the PDL. But, you know, Eduardo was like, because at that time also I don't have my papers ready yet. Mm-hmm. Because I have to, you know, I have to get my papers so that I can travel with them. But at that time I couldn't. So I have to, st- I have to play for the men's team. So I couldn't get into the PDL. You know, at that time also, you know, I'm still 
trying to learn and Eduardo was teaching us how to play soccer and all that and all. It was like, you know, and Eduardo was a very good coach, but, you know, his yelling was something that some of the players we can handle. But when it comes to coaching and technical, it's very good. I, I'm not, not going to take that. And, you know, that's where I started knowing, you know, a lot of people. I started getting getting contact, you know, people and all that. And I played for the BSA about, I think, three or four years that I played for the men's team. Wow. So I played there for a long time. So after that, and I and I play, I think I, yeah, and I think I went and played for, yeah, that's where I, I started playing for Ellis. Okay. That's where I went and played for Ellis. And Ellis, I think uh, someone connected me to Ellis. And I went there and I did a tryout there. That's the they took it and they, they picked me. Did you win the, the premier? Yeah, we won the Premier League. You went to nationals, right? Yeah, we went to nationals. And national we came fifth out of ten teams. That's pretty good. Yeah. Really One good. of our players, his name is Chris. He was the top goal scorer at nationals. Wow. Yeah. He won the top goal scorer. And yeah, nationals was very it's a good experience. And it was a very good good tournament there. Jeez. Well. So you got the high, you got to the highest levels of uh, Manitoba soccer as one yeah. going to nationals. Crazy. Yeah. So Seydu, uh, we're just kind of running out of your time here, but I wanted just to kind of get your also. How did you get involved with the tournament we're involved with, Canada Cup of Nations? Yeah, so the Canada African Cup of Nations started with Manitoba African Cup of Nations. So Manitoba African Cup of Nations was founded in 2019. So we're playing friendly games, right? And uh, we, our first game was uh, our friendly game was between Ghana and Congo because we are trying to we want to play something, you know. So we played that tournament. No, not tournament. We played that friendly game with Congo. Then Gode and I, like, you know, at that time I didn't know Gode that much, but, you know, and at that time also I was living at Pembina. So Gode brought this vision on the tournament, on the Manitoba Africa Cup of Nations because he was a very smart guy. Gode is a very smart guy. And, you know, he, he brought that vision. I was like, man, Gode, I think that's a good idea. I think we should do something like that. So we started with we started with, with our own pocket money. We have to buy balls, flags, and we have to make sure we got a field where we can do the tournament. So we find a field at St. Norbert. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's where we found the field. And, you know, we started to get teams and we get like we were making calls, we were trying to figure out what we can do and all that. And some of the teams, some of the community teams, they don't want to get involved. So we start, we 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 finally got Eritrea, Senegal, DRC, Congo, and Ghana. So we started with four teams. So that four teams, we have to play, and you know we play, we play. If we even it, what, what, we, there was if it was a heavy rain, we play in the heavy. The rain, and we played, and uh, DRC Congo won that here in 2019, and it was very fun. And we started posting on social media, and the next year, people started contacting us. Oh, they want to join. They want to join. They want to do this. So that's where we got eight teams on that year of 2020. And that year of 2020. We play the the tournament was held at a CMU field. At CMU, that's where we played the tournament in 2020. We got Nigeria, Eritrea, Ghana, DRC Congo, Kenya, Senegal, and uh, there is one team that also we got. So we got eight teams that day, that uh, that year. But it's been and Nigeria won that tournament. Wow. 2021, we got 12 teams. Nigeria also won, and that one we held it at. Red River College, their field, that's big field there. That's where we held, that's where the tournament was held. In 2022, and we came to Waverly. So that's where all this started. So from 4, 8, 12, and we went to 16. Isn't that crazy? So it's been, it's been growing every year. So every year it's been good. That's where we started, like, you know, we know some politicians, and Uzoma was there since the beginning. Uzoma was there. 
she was coming to the tournament and she was supporting she even helped us with to secure some grant you know she she was very support she was there from day one 